let's start again. <laughs> Welcome to the Irreverent Reader. This is where I like to quietly discuss religion and philosophy and ideology while adhering to absolutely none of it. Uh, since you're here, if you enjoy listening to me prattle on about ideas, go ahead and click the like button and subscribe and even ding the little bell if you would like notifications of when I upload new videos. I try to upload at least every other week. Sometimes I'm super ambitious and I upload every week. Uh, this week we are going to talk about this teeny tiny book, another little one, The Atheist Mass by Andre de Balzac. Now let's get one thing straight. There are a lot of French names in this book. Let's just assume that I am going to pronounce every single one of them incorrectly. <laughs> uh, so this teeny tiny book has two short stories in it. Neither one of them is longer than 30 pages. They're both very short stories. And yet I was absolutely moved by one of them, one of them, but I think that that was on purpose, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so this itty bitty book I found, um, at half price books where I get most of my books, uh, but I found it by itself and was very kind of surprised that it came with no introduction, no editor's notes or anything like that. Uh, it's just the two short stories plopped inside a book. Now, later I got curious and looked it up and figured out that it's actually part of a box set. Now I don't have the rest of the box set. I just found this by itself, but it's actually, can you see it? Number 41 of 80 and the 80 books are listed in the, uh, the very back. Uh, you can see, well, you can't see all of them there, but they're there. Trust me. Uh, I am going to put a link in the description box to another guy's YouTube video. And he actually has the, the full box set and he does a few readings from different ones. I think he does Marco Polo and a couple of others. Uh, and I kind of enjoyed listening to him talk about the, the various, um, uh, items that he found in there. I will also put a, an Amazon link to the box set in the description. Obviously this is not a sponsored video cause who am I? Uh, but I thought that it would be nice. It's like $73 on Amazon right now for, you know, 80 tiny books, each one being less than a dollar at that price. Um, but I kind of want the box set. I'm just not sure when I'm going to spend that money. Maybe I'll ask for it for a gift or something like that. Uh, anyhow, so who the heck is this guy? Honoré de Balzac. He was an early 19th century, um, author and novelist. He is credited as one of the founders of the realist movement, which I can understand. Uh, just reading these two very short stories was an experience. <laughs> uh, there is a depth in these pages that surprised me. Um, so, um, the two stories first, uh, is the atheist mass. Um, and again, there is no introduction or anything in this. So I sort of just dove in. Uh, so first is the atheist mass and followed by the conscript, but I am actually going to start with the conscript, come back to talk about the atheist mass, then finish up with the conscript and then, uh, 
and then close out from there. And the reason I'm going to do that is because it was very obvious that these two stories were put together on purpose. Uh, they simultaneously are vastly different while maintaining similar themes. I really was moved by the Atheist Mass. And at the end of the Atheist Mass, there's only 23 pages in the conscript. So I just went ahead and plowed on through to the end. It took me no time at all to read this book. Um, and I was sort of dumbfounded by the conscript. I I didn't know to expect this sort of stark contrast. So experiencing it with um, a sort of naivete uh, was, um, I guess, a good thing. It was good that I went into this tiny little black book with zero expectations because I think the uh, intended effect was achieved. <laughs> the conscript is a short story about an aristocratic woman in the French Revolution who is struggling to maintain her life while uh, socially appeasing the mm, local up-and-coming middle class. Uh, so I'll just read briefly from, from the conscript. To understand properly the eager curiosity and narrow-minded cunning which during that evening were expressed on the faces of all these Norman worthies, but above all to appreciate the secret worries of Madame de Day, the part she played at Carentan must be explained. As the critical position in which she was placed at the time was no doubt that of many during the revolution, the sympathies of more than one reader will give an emotional background to this narrative. Madame de Day, the widow of a lieutenant general, a chevalier of several orders, had left the court at the beginning of the emigration. As she owned considerable amount of property in the Carentan region, she had taken refuge there, hoping that the influence of the terror would be little felt in those parts. This calculation, founded on the accurate knowledge of the region, region was correct. The revolution wrought little havoc in Lower Normandy, although in the past, when Madame de Day visited her property in Normandy, she associated with only the noble families of the district. She now made a policy of opening her doors to the principal townspeople and to new authorities, trying to make them proud of having won her over, without arousing either the hatred or the jealousy. She was charming and kind and gifted with the indescribable gentleness which enabled her to please without having to lower herself or ask favors. So you can see she's a real charmer. I mean, she is actually a charmer. That's one of her gifts. Um, let me grab my note. She is a charmer. People like her. But... <clears throat> it's false. It's fake. It's pretense. She doesn't really want to be associating with these people. She's doing it to literally save her neck. She's doing it to avoid the guillotine. So all of that being the theme uh, and context of the second short story in the book, let's go back to the first. Uh, so the first, The Atheist Mass. I'm not doing very much ASMR in this video, am I? Uh, so The Atheist Mass is uh, a, the complete opposite of the conscript. 
Uh, it's still set in France uh, in, I believe it's set in the 1820s. So a little bit later, the, uh, the conscript is set in, the seven, in 1793. So a fair amount later, uh, we have the Atheist Mass. Okay. So Atheist Mass is a story of two surgeons. One is a mentor, one is the student. Um, it's the story of how a man came through life and became the person that he is. So those are always interesting stories. I always find those interesting. I want to know what makes you tick. All of you, every single one of you, no matter who you are, I want to know why you do what you do. And so I loved this story, but I had no idea how much I was going to love it. Okay, so let's get started. So I'm just kind of going to jump into a few snippets and kind of go through the ideas that they present in order to explain to you really what the story is about and how it contrasts with the other. So the two doctors. The first doctor is uh, Dr. Horace Bianchon. He's the student and he has um, he is lucky enough to have uh, gained a spot in a particular hotel under one of the most famous surgeons of the time. Um, his name is Despain, Desplains. I'm going to screw these names up. It gets a little confusing about who's saying what, uh, but I'll mostly refer to them as the student, Bianchon, or the mentor displays. Okay, <laughs> so this will just give you an idea of um, displays and, and how he begins in the story. His name, which was so famous yesterday, is almost forgotten today. It remains only in his own field without going beyond it. So, super famous. <laughs> Everybody knew who he was. But he wasn't very liked, uh, as is common with genius. He wasn't really very nice. At least it didn't seem so. He didn't seem nice. This really great man's life exhibited many pettinesses. To use the expression of his enemies who, in their jealousy, wanted to diminish his fame, but it would be more appropriate to call them apparent contradictions. Envious or stupid people who do not know the reasons which explain the activities of superior minds immediately take advantage of a few superficial contradictions to make accusations on which they obtain a momentary judgment. Okay, so all of that sort of blathery language basically says, okay, you don't like him, but you know what? That's just because he's a genius and you don't understand him. Obviously you're either jealous or you're stupid because otherwise you would understand. <laughs> so, there's a little bit of um, snobbery in here. Um, so he, he doesn't have many friends, but he does have this one student. He has this student who he is extremely fond of. This next portion, I, it's, it's twofold. Uh, it's going to show you that, you know, he really did love this pupil. But I want you to listen to how much character Balzac just crams into uh, five sentences. After these five sentences, we have a really great idea of what type of person um, Bonchon, the, the, men, the student, uh, what type of person he really is. And I think that that's impressive. Of all the pupils whom Desplain had at his hospital, Horace Bianchon was one of those to whom he became most warmly attached. Before doing his internship at the Hotel Dieu, Horace Bianchon was a medical student living in a miserable boarding house in the Latin Quarter known by the name of La Maison Vacue. There, this poor young man experienced that 
desperate poverty, which is a kind of melting pot whence great talents emerge pure and incorruptible, just as diamonds can be subjected to any kind of shock without breaking. In the violence of their unleashed passions, they acquire the most unshakable honesty, and by dint of the constant labor with which they have contained their balked appetites, they become used to the struggles which are the lot of geniuses. Horace was an upright young man, incapable of double dealings in affairs of honor, going straight to the point without fuss, as capable of pawning his coat for his friends as of giving them his time and his night's rest. What a great image of this guy who toiled uh, in order to become a doctor. He's, he's not doing this for fame or recognition or for the thank you. He's doing this as an honorable person, a good person. So that sets up his character, Bianchon, as a not necessarily reliable narrator, but definitely a narrator you can trust. So we have this uh, dichotomy set up, sort of dialectic, where you have this extremely honorable young student mentoring under um, this great genius surgeon who nobody likes. <laughs> um, so the story goes on to establish several things. Okay, they like each other. They spend a lot of time together. They uh, have a drinky poo after work every once in a while, and they confide in one another. This is Desplaine's only friend. And it turns out that they're both very like-minded. They're both atheists, you know, because it's in the title. <laughs> uh, and they both, uh, have a lot of the same um, points of view. Bianchon uh, witnesses a couple of things that kind of surprise him. He he sees some behavior while this this unlikable man uh, shares many opinions with him. He uh, it doesn't always act in the way you expect him to. The first behavior that kind of makes Bianchon stop and say, wait, what? Is um, Desplain gives of his time specifically to the poor. Uh, if he is presented with uh, somebody who is starving uh, and somebody who is in need of help but cannot pay, Desplain doesn't blink an eye. He is immediately uh, giving freely of care. And that surprises uh, Bianchon because uh, people that you don't like, who are unlikable, aren't generally generous like that. They're not usually the first person to give the coat off of their back. Displain is. And so we build in the character this sort of uh, tentative admiration. Uh, the second uh, event is really sort of the inciting factor. So the second event is the inciting factor that m begins our, our true journey in this short story. And that second event is that Bianchon witnesses displaying enter a church and uh, not only does he enter the church at 9 a.m., 9 o'clock in the morning, he's going into this church, he's going to Mass, and he attends Mass, and he attends Mass seemingly as a pious person, and so Bianchon is really taken aback by this and feels the need to follow uh, his, his teacher and find out what the heck is going on. So that brings us to our next snippet. He certainly didn't come to clear up questions about the virgin birth, said Bianchon in boundless astonishment. If I had seen him holding one of the tassels of the canopy on Chris, Corpus Christi Day, I would have taken it for a joke. 
But at this hour, alone, with no one to see him, that certainly gives one food for thought. So Bianchon later says, uh, he finds Desplaines and says, uh, hey, what was that about? But Desplaines blows him off. So time passes. Uh, and Desplaines doesn't believe him. He's like, I, I don't, that was too weird. That was strange. You know, okay, I'm going to let this go. I'm going to wait until I really get an opportunity to ask him about it. Time passes. They have other conversations that really cement the fact that clearly Desplaines is an atheist. Desplaines is an atheist. And eventually, Bianchon is no longer Desplaines' student. So he has to go his separate ways. And it is only occasionally that they're able to really talk to one another. And it's about 10 years later when the good stuff happens. And this is very short. It's, I mean, it's condensed into just a couple of, like a page even, this passage of time. But now it's 10 years later. And, you know, Desplain is at the end of his career. He isn't concerned with what people might think think of his religiosity or not. And Bianchon finds out that not only has he attended this mass, he goes four times a year to the specific mass. And this specific mass, Desplain found it. So he's paid the Monsignor and the church to um, put this mass on four times a year. And so finally, Bianchon kind of, you know, pulls him aside at a party and he says, okay, this is enough. You got to talk to me. Tell me what's going on. I have to know. And so they go outside the party and this is where the really good story happens. Uh, I'm not going to read it to you because it is about 10 pages. It's a 10 page soliloquy. It is a speech almost uh, filled with with heartache and fear and uncertainty and I really want you to read it for yourself. I don't even want to give you a snippet of it, not even a little piece of the 10 pages because going through the emotional journey with Desplaine was uh, was touching. I was absolutely touched by this story uh, and I'm going to put a link in the description. Both of these stories are public domain so go to the link in the description and read the story for yourself. Desplaines' story is one of, uh, well, first of all, it's multi-layered. First of all, there's philosophy. There's the the ideas um, about mm, societal structure and the difficulty of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, how there's really no such thing. There's no way to like really get yourself up from the lowest point. There is, however, what does work is generosity and kindness and how other people can completely save you from yourself and other people can give you things that you never thought anybody would give you without asking for anything in return. And it really is just a beautiful, lovely story that you must go read. So I'll put the link down there. (laughs) So I have this story that's so touching that I'm not even going to share it with you on this video because I want you to experience it. And I finished reading it and I was moved and I stopped and remember I had no idea what was coming next, but I only had 23 pages left. So I thought, yeah. Okay, you know, if that story, 27 pages long, was that beautiful, let's, uh, let's keep going and see what this next one has to give me. I'm, I'm so moved. I'm, I'm nearly to the point where I feel the need to hold displaying up as a moral icon. Uh, <laughs> and then I come barreling in to the conscript (laughs) and I have to face Madame the day who is not the other thing. Nope. Nope. She's kind of horrible. Kind of awful.
Oh, I'm not going to read you any of the conscript either. Uh, that one's super short. And I felt nothing for this woman. Her biggest concern in the story is the well-being of her only child, the absolute only person she has left in the world. And she's struggling to uh, survive as an aristocrat in this new uh, middle-class world. And she wants nothing more than to know that her child is okay. But her child is a royalist. He is only in danger because he has gone uh, to fight against the revolutionaries. So as... And maybe this is because I grew up in the United States and it's really pounded into us the importance of the revolution, uh, the French Revolution and the American Revolution, arm in arm and, you know, fighting against the aristocracy. It's very much pounded into us that that's a good thing. But I cannot bring myself to sympathize with a royalist. I just can't do it. I don't know why. That's silliness. I don't, you know, at the beginning of this video, I said, but I don't, I don't adhere to any of these philosophies. <laughs> I guess that's kind of not true. I guess it's kind of, uh, it's inevitable that I not have any ideals, whether I chose them or not. Yeah, I was certainly indoctrinated into ideals as we all are through schooling and culture and, you know, norms and mores. That's what we got. That's what we live by, norms and mores. So I think that this revolutionary uh, um, iconography that I grew up with, this, this mm, sort of idolizing of the <laughs> the uh, the revolution revolution you know uh, it was a little bit more deeply ingrained in me than I knew until I read this story and found the royalist absolutely and the aristocrat absolutely disgusting <laughs> so silly and absurd um, so yeah, it's just the story of this snob who is clinging to her riches and blowing smoke in order to keep the middle class from literally cutting off her head because those were basically her two options. You know, be nice to the middle class or we'll kill you. And, you know, eat the rich. Uh, there's no love. There's no real care. There's no kindness. Everything she does is for complete selfish reasons. And so I think it was absolutely on purpose that it was on purpose that these two stories were teamed together the way that they were. You have first this story filled with love and kindness and generosity and beauty and transformation and complexity of character uh, that really pulls you in, in my opinion. I think it's a beautiful story. Uh, and then you're slapped upside the face <laughs> with this uh, trite, not quite a comedy of errors. It's not quite, I mean, it might be a little bit of a comedy. And it's not even farce because it, it is realistic it's it's completely honest but it's certainly um, without warmth <laughs> it is. I don't know if that was if that will be the same experience for anybody who knows what they're going into that may have been strictly my experience as someone who came upon a situation. Uh, I certainly, absolutely, 100% recommend that you go right now after you like, subscribe, and I guess ding the bell if you'd like. Uh, go down to the description, follow the link to uh, 
the Atheist Mass and read the story. And the second one, the conscript, the link is in the description. Meh, read it if you want. Don't if you don't. Um, or you can grab both of them and plop them back to back and attempt to have the same experience I did. I don't know that that's possible. But anyhow, uh, next we're hopefully going to be going into a couple of books that I really like. Uh, getting into a little bit more of the absurd, because I do love absurdity. Uh, less uh, seriousness. Let's have a little bit of fun from here on out. Uh, but yeah, Honoré de Balzac, I think. Um, pardon my French, and I mean that literally, not as a euphemism. Pardon my actual horrible French. <laughs> I'm so funny. Uh, and thanks for watching my video.